For this next three weeks, God willing, we're going to do a very short series, a mini-series, in the Gospel of John and in John chapter 17. It's sometimes called Jesus' High Priestly Prayer. Uh, so we're going to look at it in three stages. There are perhaps three divisions to that prayer. It's a wonderful prayer that Jesus prays to his Father. And I've called this first uh, message, the first one, first part of the prayer, the conqueror prays for his glory. Now, if you could keep John 17 open in front of you, the first five verses we're going to be looking at, uh, this part of Jesus' prayer, uh, but also the, the very last verse of the previous chapter, which I think helps us to understand a little bit why I've called it the conqueror prays. Uh, so if you look at those verses, that'll be really helpful as we go through this together now. Now, listening to the news recently, as many of us have done a few weeks ago, I was um, heard a, a, a reporter, he'd been interviewing someone in the street, just asking him about uh, the current situation that we're in. Uh, and this person, I think he was with his girlfriend at the time, uh, said he said he, it felt as though the world was ending with all that's going on. Now, you may agree that the world is in a, a bit of a mess at the moment. Some might say that we're heading nowhere except downwards. And where can we go? Where can you go to find any hope in this current situation? Now, I believe that you need a view of something of such great worth that it outshines all the, the ugliness and the horror and the mess uh, and the dishonour of this world. Something that, you, that lifts up your head. Something that makes you realise there is hope. Now here in this, in this part of God's word in, in John 17, the disciples uh, are really privileged to listen in to the prayer, a prayer that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, offers up to his Father. He speaks audibly in their presence, uh, their presence they're there listening, they hear him pray to his Heavenly Father. So many commentators have said, and I think it's, it's true, isn't it, that we really, really are on holy ground as we consider this passage together. What intimacy there is here between the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus. And it starts with a request from the Son to the Father concerning himself. And then it moves on, we'll look in, in the following weeks, uh, to how he prays for his disciples, and then how he get, then goes on to pray for all of his followers worldwide, uh, his whole church at, in, at all time, which includes you and I. So what a great comfort right at the start to know that as a believer in Jesus, if you are a believer in him, that he is praying for his church right now. The Lord Jesus is praying to the Father for his church. He's praying to the Father for our church, for us here, Upton Baptist Church in, in 2020. And he's also praying for you as one of his people, as a believer in him. Now, what would you think that Jesus uh, might pray for as his death approach? That's what's, uh, what the situation that Jesus is in here. Uh, his death is looming. It's going to be the next day. Uh, what would you pray for if you knew that you were going to die within the next 24 hours? Yeah, that's a question you can think about. What does Jesus pray for when he knows that he is going to be killed the following day? The first thing that he prays for uh, is for God's glory to be displayed and for him to be glorified. How is God's glory displayed? Well, maybe you can think of different ways that God's glory is displayed in the world. The Bible gives us a few, a few other ways of seeing how God's glory is displayed. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, it says the heavens declare the glory of God. So God's glory is seen in creation, in the heavens, above uh, the, uh, the sky and, the, and the, the sun, the moon, the stars. We also uh, see something of God's glory revealed in the Old Testament when Moses went up Mount Sinai. Uh, he was, God's glory was revealed to him then in a different kind of way. And as he came down, his face shone. He'd seen something of the glory of God. It was a fading glory. Peter, James and John were, were uh, privileged to go up onto a mountain with the Lord Jesus during Jesus' ministry where he was transfigured before them and some of his glory was seen by them. So the glory of God is seen and has been seen in various ways uh, as the Bible outlines there. But God's glory is most clearly seen in the Son and in his cross. That is the place we see God's glory to his its fullest extent uh, and all that he achieved at the cross in eternal life for the elect uh, and his exaltation into heaven now at God's right hand 
Now you might say that if someone was to claim a victory before even going into battle, you may say that's quite a presumptuous thing to do, to say that you have gained a victory uh, before uh, the result has been, uh, has been announced. And we've perhaps seen some of that this week uh, in America. How could you know whether you will win or not? Uh, in the Second World War, in the Second Battle of El Alamein, which began on the 23rd of October 1942, it ended 12 days later. And it was one of the, the first uh, large-scale Allied land victories of the war. And Field Marshal Montgomery at the time correctly predicted both the length of the battle and the number of casualties, which was 13,500 men. And he got it pretty much right. But Jesus here, um, he's doing more than just predicting what he expects to happen. In fact, Jesus here talks in such a way as though it had already happened. And his people then enter into that victory. It's as though he's saying at the end of chapter 16, take heart, I have overcome the world and you most certainly will also conquer. Imagine a climber uh, climbing his way up a, a nearly impossible uh, rock face, uh, but he's the best climber in the world and he gets all the way to the top and then he calls down to his partner, don't be afraid, I've made it, you can come up now. And you are now roped up to him as he brings you up, you won't lose your foothold. So Jesus has won the victory. He is the overcomer. He has conquered. Uh, he, he, now all authority is given to him and he calls us to enter into that same victory. So this is why I've called it uh, the conqueror's prayer. So we're going to look at three aspects of Christ's glory. The first two aspects of his glory we experience in this life. Uh, and the third view of his glory we haven't yet seen but we will one day. So firstly, our first point, see Christ's glory through the cross. And maybe look at verses one and four um, as we go through this. So Jesus had just finished his, um, his, his discourse, his, his conversation with his disciples in the upper room, uh, when he seemingly, without stopping, lifts his eyes to heaven and prays aloud in the hearing of all of his disciples. It's like he moves seamlessly from talking to them uh, and giving them instruction about many things, including the Holy Spirit. And then as he's, as he's continuing his, his discourse with them, as he's telling them things, he stops and he starts to pray to God. He lifts up his eyes to heaven, moves seamlessly and naturally from talking to his disciples to talking to his Father in heaven. And he, says, he looks up his, uh, his eyes uh, to heaven and he, and he begins to pray to his Father while they're all gathered around him. So prayer was the air that the Lord Jesus breathed as he prayed to his Father. He is the prayer par excellence. And he knows that the Father will answer him the prayers that he brings to him. And so he says to his Father, Father, the hour has come. It's now time. The time that the Father and the Son had planned from all eternity is now about to happen. That is the hour that Jesus talks about. The agreement that they had between Father, Son and Holy Spirit for their glory to be displayed. The time has come for it to happen. But how will this glory of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be displayed? Well, it's through the glory of the Son uh, being displayed at the cross. The time has come for the Son to return to the Father as Jesus Christ. But what is the route by which the Son will return to the Father? It's time now for Jesus to go to the Father, but there's a certain way he must go to get to the Father. And it's through the cross. But when we say the word the cross, what does that actually mean? We may just think of the, that wooden structure, uh, Golgotha. Is Jesus just talking about that as the cross, where he's crucified? Well, yes, but more than that. The cross, when we talk about the cross, uh, it includes... Uh, and involves the crucifixion, the resurrection on the third day, his ascension into heaven 40 days later, and then his coronation in heaven as he took his place seated at God's right hand. So when you think of the cross, think of it as a, um, a one event that encompasses all of that. That is what the cross means. So think of it as Jesus taking his place in heaven. The time has come, Jesus is saying, uh, for Jesus is overcoming the world. He said he's already overcome it, 
uh, but it's, this is the way he will do it and the time has, has now arrived the hour has come now it's interesting isn't it that although this was uh, the plan of the father the son and the spirit from all eternity to happen uh, and jesus knew it was going to happen he still prays to the father for him to carry it through jesus prays that the father will glorify the son even though they've agreed that it will happen the father is going to do it he still prays that god will do it uh, that who the son is will be displayed to a watching world so he's asking the father lord Reveal to this world my glory. Show the watching world who I am. But why does Jesus pray for his own glory? You may think that's a bit self-focused. But he prays for his own glory so that the Son may glorify the Father. The Father is honoured and glorified when the Son, Jesus, is honoured and glorified. Now you and I cannot honour the Father you and I cannot honour God, the Father, unless you honour and worship his Son, Jesus Christ. That is the only way that you and I can bring honour to God the Father is through us honouring and worshipping his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you think much of Christ, when you worship him and serve him, you also bring glory to the Father. It's through the, through the Son that the Father has revealed himself through the Son that the Father has revealed his glory. So Jesus says to his Father in verse 4, I glorified you on the earth by accomplishing all the work that you gave me to do. Now Jesus here hasn't yet gone to the cross, but he speaks as though he's already accomplished it. So certain is he that it's going to happen, that, he's, that he will endure what he's about to go through. Jesus has fully completed the mission he was sent by the Father to do. He was sent on a specific task and with a specific objective so that he would then know when the work was completed. He is in effect saying to the Father, it's mission accomplished, I finished the work. Now we all like the satisfaction, don't we, of, of doing a job well done, that you've achieved what you uh, set out to do or you, you did the task that someone else gave you to do. There's that sense of satisfaction, isn't there, to get to the end of a day. And you know that you've done a good day's work. You've worked hard and you've achieved all that you had to do that day. And Margaret Thatcher, whatever you think of her, uh, said this once. Look at a day when you are supremely satisfied at the end of it. It's not a day when you lounge around doing nothing. It's a day when you've had everything to do and you've done it. She was a very driven person. But the, the principle is there, isn't it? we have that sense of satisfaction of a job well done and all of our work has value and importance to God uh, as we do it to serve him uh, it's, it's to be done to bring glory to him yet some work is of a much higher level and the stakes couldn't be higher and that was the work the mission that the Lord Jesus was sent to accomplish by the Father it would bring him glory but what was the mission what was the mission that the Father sent the Son to do that he could say here that he has accomplished even though he's still yet to go through the cross? Well, the mission that the Father sent the Son on was a mission to save sinners. The angel said to Mary, You will call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what he came to do, to save sinners. Now, isn't it such a comfort to know that the thing that brings the Father most glory is that his Son, Jesus Christ, came on a mission to save sinners. Doesn't that give you hope? I wonder, do you feel your sin? Do you know that you are a sinner who has broken God's law and who has failed him time and again? Do you feel that God could not possibly want anything to do with you because of how bad you are, how awful you are. Now I don't care what you do, what you've done. Is your sin serious? Have you maybe done some awful things in your life? Have you hurt others? Have you offended a holy God? We all have it to one degree or another. Do you feel a sense of your guilt and of your shame, but yet also think that God could never love or forgive me? But you see, God is glorified, he's made much of, 
um, who he is, is seen most clearly in his son Jesus Christ going to the cross to save you from your sin. For you to find forgiveness and to find eternal life, that is what brings glory to God. And so it's to eternal life that we now turn. Secondly, see Christ's glory in eternal life. Looking at verses um, 2 and 3 uh, in John 17. So Jesus the conqueror prays for his glory to be seen by his people and in his people. All authority has been given to him. He has overcome the world. Uh, the Father has also given him given something else to the Son. A certain number of individuals out of the whole of humanity to whom Christ will give eternal life. All the people who make up his worldwide church for all time, the elect. The Father has given such those to the Son. And so the glory of Christ is to give eternal life to those that the Father has given to him. And that's to you this morning if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and are trusting in him. And so the one thing that everyone is seeking after, whether we know it or not, is eternal life. That is the one thing that you, deep down, know that you want, that I want. It's the one thing that every person needs, not just a life that lasts forever, though of course that's part of it. Uh, no one wants to die, do we really? We all want life, we all want to live, but it's a life of joy, of peace, of happiness, of relationship and love, one that lasts forever. That's the thing that you and I really want in life. However it is you're going about pursuing that, whatever it is you're doing in your life to try and attain it, that is really deep down what you want. Eternal life, joy, happiness, peace, relationship, love forever. But have you found it? Have you found what you are looking for in your search for this eternal life? This eternal life then that Jesus speaks about, it's uh, it's about a personal relationship with the everlasting God. It's not just life that lasts forever. Some people not, might not want that if it's going to be a miserable life. But this is a, a personal relationship with the everlasting God. You see, eternal life, real life, is all about knowing God. That is what eternal life is. To know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom the Father has sent. That is eternal life, says Jesus. And so to know Jesus, uh, that's the only access to knowing God. And so it's not just a head knowledge that we have of him, but it's, a fe it's fellowship with him, it's friendship with him. As Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, I have called you friends. So it's a personal trust in Christ and faith in him, a personal relationship with God, the Father, through knowing Christ. But how do you and I know God? If this is where eternal life is to be found, real life, how do you and I get to know God? Well, it must start with head knowledge. You must know something about him, about who the Lord Jesus Christ is and who God is. Now, we live in something of a paradox in the, uh, the 21st century. Uh, never before has there been a time when, we, when we've had so many uh, Bibles around or printed or online, so many Christian books, yet there's probably never been a, a time since the Dark Ages where there's been as much ignorance in the English-speaking world at least as there is today about the Bible and about the person of Christ. The prophet Hosea in the Old Testament uh, said in his day that the people were destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Paul spoke of his own people, uh, the Jews, as alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. If you don't know your Bible or read it, you will not know about Christ and you'll never be able to get to know him personally. So it must start with a head knowledge, understanding who he is and grasping that and getting hold of that from his word, the Bible. But after the head knowledge must come the intimacy of relationship. The Bible talks about knowing someone, to know someone. It, it's a, a deep, intimate, personal knowledge of that person uh, in relationship. Now maybe you remember your conversion, uh, however that happened. Uh, my own conversion at the age of 22. Uh, I did have a fair amount of head knowledge uh, at that time. I'd been brought up in a Christian home. 
uh, taken to church um, numerous times during the day and Sunday school and the youth club and I had a lot of head knowledge but it wasn't until the age of 22 uh, that I came uh, to f for that head knowledge to become heart knowledge. My heart wasn't affected despite having all that head knowledge for those many years. But then God, God graciously saved me at the age of 22. And only then did I come to know this Jesus and that he knew me in a personal living relationship. And it was then that his word uh, and he came alive to me. But knowing Christ um, also means a growing knowledge of him. So I wonder, are you increasing in your knowledge of Christ? This is how you grow as a believer. Uh, how you become more like the Lord Jesus, which ultimately is what the Lord wants for you, to grow in knowledge of him. It's true, isn't it, that you, you take on the appearance uh, of the thing that your, the, your eyes and your heart gaze upon the most. If your eyes and heart are taken up with unworthy things, you will become like them. But if you're taken up with worthy things and good things, you become like them. And so the Bible tells us to think about honourable things. A married couple, perhaps who've been together and in love for years, uh, can behave and start to behave and think and even look the same. It's interesting, on a, a few weeks ago, I was on one of the, the weekly Zoom calls I go on with, with some of the pastors in the, in the country. And uh, I'd seen this one guy there a few times over the past months. Uh, and on this one occasion, a few weeks ago, his wife was there with him and they looked very much the same. The more time you spend with the Lord in getting to know him, the more you will become like him. The more you are like Christ, the more you will then reveal him to others and the more glory you will bring to God. And so we all as true believers show to some degree and in some way, uh, more than others, uh, the glory of Christ by our lives. And so we're to display that glory to others. And so that's, what, that's why Christ prays for us uh, in everyday life that believers are the world's best hope of seeing the glory of God. What, what chance is there for people in the world to see God, see his glory? Well, it's in his people, to see God's glory in his people. And we're to reflect his glory in an increasing way as we grow in Christ-likeness. Jesus himself made the Father's glory understandable. He revealed that glory to us. And we are to do the same for others as well. So we must be people of the word, um, which is our most accurate source of knowledge about Christ. We, we must meditate on the cross because here is the clearest demonstration of the love of the Father. We must spend time with those who know him so that their knowledge will pass on to us, spending time with other believers. And in doing these things, we will experience the answers to our Saviour's prayer for us. So we now come uh, thirdly and finally uh, to the aspect of Christ's glory which we have not yet seen but one day will. So thirdly, see Christ's glory in heaven. Now in a sense the previous sights of God's glory, uh, the glory of the cross uh, and seeing his glory in knowing him are only partial. Uh, one day we will appreciate the glory of the cross in its fullness. We haven't got there yet. Uh, one day we will know God fully. We haven't got there yet. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, uh, Now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Yet now we do not see Jesus in his glory with our physical eyes. We can't see him in that glory uh, physically, but we must use our eyes of faith to consider that glory in some way, awaiting the time when as believers we will see him in his glory. So Jesus continues his prayer for asking God to glorify him in verse 5. He's brought glory to the Father on earth through completing the mission and Jesus was about to return to the Father's presence as the one who is the conqueror, the one who overcame, the one who's redeemed a people for himself. All his people will behold the glory of the one who saved them and brought them to glory. He had lived in and enjoyed this glory in the Father's presence from before creation, before anything else had ever existed, before there was the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, before there was anything else, there was God. The Father, the Son and the Spirit always existed and shared their glory in perfect intimacy. 
and each of them gave honour to the other from all eternity past. But now Jesus as the raised and transformed and glorified man Christ Jesus, he's going to return to heaven and resume the glory as the lamb who was slain. The one who has rescued a people for himself and he's going to go into heaven in this way as that, as that man. The writer of Hebrews tells us, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So Jesus is looking forward to and anticipating again his return to the Father and the joy that was going to await him in heaven and that enabled him to endure the cross, which was the way to the Father. So Jesus always had infinite glory in eternity past. and if But infinite glory cannot be increased. But the glory that Jesus is going to now is going to be greater in that in that now people and angels will be able to see and understand this glory. When there was before uh, before creation, there was no one else to see and behold and wonder at and delight in the glory of God. But now that Jesus is ascending to heaven, both men and angels can um, delight in and, and see this glory of God. So he's sharing his glory with others. We can all have that delight and a pleasure in the glory of God. That's what's intended to do us good, knowing and seeing this glory of God. So how can you make use of this mighty truth about the glory of Christ? I'm, I'm hoping that it isn't all just head knowledge and something in there, but how can this actually affect our lives as believers? How can this change us? It's a glorious and a wonderful truth. How can his cross, how can knowing him in eternal life, how can his glory in heaven uh, change us and be of a benefit for us here and now, today, tomorrow, this coming week, as we go into this next uh, month or whatever of lockdown, whatever. Contemplating and dwelling on them can change you from the inside out. It can change your heart. If you were to ask a, a science student, what is the most effective way to get all the air out of a cup, what might they say? You may get many answers of how you can get a machine to create a vacuum uh, to, to, to draw the air out. Sounds quite complicated. But the easiest way to fill a cup is to put some coffee into it, or tea, or juice, or whatever it is you're going to drink after this time together. There's a great Scottish preacher who once termed, termed it this way. He talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. How we're to have a new affection within us which has an expulsive power, it pushes out what is not meant to be there. So that the level to which you allow the knowledge of Christ's glory to fill your being will determine how much glory you will be changed into. You must know Jesus for that expulsive force to work within you. You must look longingly and intently at Jesus. You will seek to gaze upon his glory and ponder him and think about him and let his glory and majesty be the thing that you that your heart is taken up with and contemplates the most. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So I wonder, for the rest of today, tonight, this coming week, each day, will you take the time required to behold the glory of the Lord?